slurry, which because of its density prevents the hole from collapsing. Then massive steel support beams are placed either end of the trench to reinforce it. Eventually, concrete is poured in and the slurry is pumped out. The concrete sets solid and what is left is a reinforced concrete wall. Repeat this process hundreds of times either side of the elevated artery and you have a three mile long supporting wall that not only bears the weight of the entire roadway, but becomes the tunnel walls. There was a jacking system that literally pick up take on the weight of the existing highway. The weight then would be transferred to the new structure and in the end the new structure was now holding all the weight that the old structure used to hold. You cut away the legs and nothing moves. Uh, this was done 68 times all the way through the downtown area for a six-lane elevated highway. In total, the team jack up 552,000 tons of steel and concrete, more than four times the weight of London's Tower Bridge. Throughout the entire process, the heavy traffic above inches forward on the elevated roadway, none the wiser. By now, the Big Dig is in full swing, tunneling its way through the city, directly under the elevated roadway. 5,500 people are employed every day on the project, and payroll and production costs exceed $3 million a day. Construction crews work around the clock, six days a week. 5,000 hard hats are issued every working day. 150 cranes punctuate the skyline. Tunneling through downtown Boston is like being on an archaeological dig. We would be six feet off of a building foundation over here or maybe ten feet off the corner of another building over there. It soon becomes clear where the city limits once lay. We did run across seawalls and wharf pilings and foundations of all types. Occasionally you'd run into, say, porcelain and, and other materials and little bottles and things. The opportunity to dig through one of America's oldest cities sets the real archaeologists scrambling for their trowels. Now housed in the basement of an old police station are boxes of artifacts found in the landfill. Ellen Birkeland is an archaeologist for the city and curator of the collection. This is actually a, a batter bowl. It's sort of the Tupperware, if you will, of the of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Oh, this is this is sweet. This is sweet. This is a tankard, an ale tankard. It's a redware. This is a milk pan to cool milk down quickly. It has a large surface area. Something else that was common to every every household in Boston: a chamber pot. They didn't have indoor plumbing back in the 1600s. <laughs> We have a bone-handled knife, sweet little fork, and part of a metal knife. And of course, the cigarette butt of the 16, 17, 18, 1900s, tobacco pipes. And we find thousands of fragments of white ball clay smoking pipes. It was an opportunity uh, that we'll never see again. Uh, we were able to go in and systematically look at an urban area and carefully excavate the, the past lives of, of those early Bostonians. Back in the present day, the Big Dig team is tunneling its way through the city. By now, modern Bostonians are complaining that the build is taking too long and costing too much. The original $2.6 billion estimated budget has increased five-fold to an incredible $14.6 billion. And the locals have been living in the construction site for nearly a decade. One community affected is the North End, Boston's historic Italian quarter. This is now the Big Dig's front line, and local resident Nancy Caruso 
has led the fight to make sure the community gets a fair deal. You know, engineers are, are funny people. Uh, you either mesh with them and they understand you and you can talk, or they're in their own world and they're going to do it their way, even though they'll say to your face, oh yes, I understand. The residents first met the construction team back in 1993. We had only one question that we want to resolve. No 24-hour construction, period. Our demand was simple, and it was really very reasonable, we thought. We want eight hours sleep. No noise between 11 o'clock at night and 7 in the morning. They didn't listen to us. It took us three years before we got their attention and they got religion. Realizing that they have to work with the community, the team bends over backwards to accommodate their wishes. But it's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, I can't deny this frustration, sure. Um, I mean, in your weaker moment, you say, gee, if they just close the city for a few years, you know, I'd, I'd get this in the ground and be done with it. This process, known as mitigation, has cost almost a third of the entire budget. We changed designs repeatedly um, in order to accommodate their needs. Now, did that have an effect on the cost of the project? Absolutely. The, the dollar cost to the agency goes up, but the total cost to society goes down because you're, you're cleaning up after yourself. You're not dumping these problems on others. In August 2002, as part of the mitigation process, the unfinished tunnel is open to 600,000 members of the public to walk through. It's the first time that the people of Boston can actually see what is being done under their city. By 2004, the Big Dig, one of America's largest and most technically challenging public works projects, is nearing completion. The eight-lane superhighway stretching under the city is now open to traffic, and it's being closely monitored 24 hours a day at the Operations Control Center. This state-of-the-art facility contains one of the most advanced electronic traffic monitoring systems in the world. Using more than 45,000 sensors and cameras, a team of 22 operators manage traffic, detect and respond to fires and accidents, maintain security and control ventilation, lighting and air quality throughout the entire system. From the moment you enter the tunnel, the minute you exit, they're watching. In the spring of 2004, the old six-lane double-deck bridge crossing the Charles River is demolished. For a year, it has been overshadowed by a new neighbor. The Leonard P. Zakim Bridge is now the crowning piece of the project and the gateway to Boston. The bridge's Y-shaped towers reach 270 feet high. The 116 cable stays holding up the 100,000-ton roadway suggest a ship in full sail to evoke Boston's connection with the sea. With 10 lanes of traffic, it is the widest cable-stayed bridge in the world. And the public love it. It's been over 17 years since the Big Dig was first funded, and the project is nearing completion. But in this final hour, the team discover a serious flaw in the construction. By the summer of 2004, Construction of the Big Dig Tunnel is nearing completion. It has been over 17 years since the project's funding was first approved, and the team are nearly home 
and dry. But then, at 11.45 a.m. on September the 15th, 250 gallons of water a minute comes bursting through the wall of the northbound tunnel, 70 feet below ground in downtown Boston. I was actually in a meeting with engineering, the engineering managers, and we, we looked at each other and, and said, water coming into the, into the I-93 tunnel. We all know as engineers that the structure of the tunnel is very, very robust. Two of the highway lanes are cordoned off, and traffic backs up for miles while the team of engineers investigate. Initially, they think it's a burst water main or a fire hydrant. And the immediate thought was, is there a utility breach somewhere at the surface? Because no one would have thought in their mind that, that this was actually a leak in the wall. It's soon realized that the billion-dollar tunnel has developed a serious flaw. That evening, the team closed the tunnel and removed the tiled panel from the offending room. It's discovered that the huge pressure of groundwater has forced an eight-inch hole in the slurry wall, and it's flowing in fast. And at the equivalent of seven stories below street level, the groundwater pressure is immense. By nine o'clock that evening, a temporary patch has been forced into the hole and the flow diverted. I can tell you personally I'm outraged. I'm absolutely outraged. With the press and politicians baying for blood, public confidence in the big dig plummets, especially when it's discovered that the defect is a construction flaw in the slurry wall. You know, what we had in the breach panel of September 15th is when that slurry wall was actually constructed, some of the slurry mixture was trapped in the concrete mixture. There was a weakened section of concrete. The water pressure was able to, over time, work its way through this slurry and forced out a hole in the concrete wall of about eight inches in diameter. But if there is an imperfection in one slurry wall, how many other flaws might there be? Work is now ongoing to make sure there are no other hidden surprises. Just the disappointment of having a flaw manifest itself in such a, a disruptive way. It's an imperfect world. Um, you strive for perfection. Uh, you want everything to be right all the time. And uh, um, disappointment is really the key. By mid-2005, the team is still trying to swing public opinion, but it's an uphill struggle. To make matters worse, the state of Massachusetts alleged poor construction management in some parts of the Big Dig. And federal prosecutors investigate allegations that the largest supplier of concrete to the project delivered substandard goods. The allegations are strongly denied. With the tunnel now open to traffic, the team start tearing down the aging and dirty elevated expressway that has cast a shadow over the city since the 1950s. The effect is immediate. I thought to myself, my God, look at the light. It is so bright. I had to go back home to get my sunglasses. It was that bright. And the air, the air smelled fresh and clean. In place of the elevated roadway will be 27 acres of tree-lined public parks, plazas, and open spaces. As a result, it's estimated that the city's carbon monoxide levels will drop by 12%. Even the dirt from the big dig is being put to a good cause. This is Granite Links Golf Course in Quincy, just eight miles south of Boston. Before the big dig, this was a disused landfill site. But over the last decade, 13 million tons of earth has been dumped here. 
That's up to 1,200 truckloads of dirt every day.